minutes here before we move on to something else and we're going to recognize the presence of God here today and we're going to press in we're going to go deeper with God know about you, but I need a touch from God. I don't know why you came here today, but I came to have an encounter with the living God. And if that's not why you're here, then please just bear with us for a, a couple minutes. But if that's why you're here, I want you to close your eyes and just forget about anyone around you for just a moment. We're going to focus on the one we came here to meet with. Because he's here today. He's here today.
You're the reason we came. You're the reason we're here to meet with you. Jesus, do whatever you want to do with us today. And let us be willing and available and obedient to your will today. Let us not miss an opportunity privilege of being used by you. We just acknowledge your presence in today. And we say that you're wonderful. something we need to leave here with us leave here. There's something you need to impart to us. If there's a work you need to do in this God. Please let it be done this morning. And we thank you for everything you're doing, everything you're gonna do. We ask all these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Can somebody say amen today? Money is a necessary part of our lives. With it, we buy food and clothing, we pay our bills, and we spend it in countless other ways. But when the Bible looks at how we spend our money, it skips right past these spending habits and looks instead at our hearts. In Matthew 6.21, Jesus tells us that our hearts belong to the thing we treasure most. He then warns us that it is not possible to serve both God and money. This is why it is important to take time and reflect on what the top priority in our hearts is. So let's look at three questions we can reflect on to ground ourselves in the Bible and really take an honest look at who or what our hearts are serving. First, what does my spending say about what makes me most happy? We all spend our money on whatever we think will bring us the most joy. This means that if our joy is really coming from God, then our spending will show it. But if other things have stolen our heart, we'll find that we have few resources left over for helping the cause of the gospel. Number two, does my spending suggest I'm collecting for this life? The Bible often reminds us that we should store our treasure in heaven where it will never be lost. So when we're tempted to collect for a few short decades here, we need to be reminded that only money invested in the kingdom of God will last. And number three, is my spending explicitly supporting the spread of the gospel? Jesus is coming back, and if we truly believe this, we will do everything we can to see our friends and family come to know Him. We can't buy conversions, but a generous heart can be a powerful example of how our trust is in God and not our money. And oftentimes, this kind of generosity can open the door to Christ-centered conversations that we never thought possible. No one is going to be perfect when it comes to managing money, but when God is truly at the center of our hearts, instead of the desire for more money, we will be happier and more generous because our hope is secure in Him. 
Amen. Good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing? It's a little cooler. Yes. All right. A little bit. So anyway, glad you're here. If you're here for the first time, we greet you in the name of Jesus. Thank you so much for being a part of our service. We are a, uh, a Jesus church, and so we're not a denomination, not a part of any, anything. We just want to serve him. And uh, the Bible says, for God, our Father, loved us so much that he gave his son Jesus to die in our place so that we would not perish if we believe in him, but we will have everlasting life. And so that's why we focus on Jesus. Amen. So uh, if you're here today, man, we just encourage you just to sit back and relax. And right now you're probably thinking, man, what in the world? I'm, I'm coming here and he's going to talk about money. I must be on the wrong, <laughs> wrong week. No, you're on the right week because uh, we believe God has uh, something for every single one of us. And uh, but before we do that, let's give a big shout out to those who are watching online, our online congregation. Hey guys, glad you're watching. And uh, anybody got the word? Word up, hold it in the air like you really, really care. Say it together. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. It is a lamp to my feet, a light into my path. I will hide his word in my heart so that I might not sin against God. Holy Spirit, give me ears to hear and strength to obey. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. Amen, amen. So glad that you're here. We have so many who are out on vacation. We're just praying that they have a great time with their, with their families, making memories and getting sunburned and all those types of good things. It's all good. And uh, our crew in Panama, we know all about sunburns, don't we? It's, uh, it was good. Listen, today we are on the conclusion of our series. We did a three-week series called Unstrapped. And the reason why is I really had a heart to see who, a lot of people who are struggling with their, their finances, their debt. Their, they have a lot of credit card debt, you know, and it's just like a, it's a trigger in a lot of marriages when uh, you can't pay the bills or you can't do the things you want to, you know, and you say things like, well, we could go on vacation, but we're strapped. Or we can do something, you know, where we're strapped. We can have babies, but we're strapped. Buy a house, but we're strapped. And the whole the whole point of this, and I really believe God just laid on my heart, help them get unstrapped. And uh, because you really have a freedom when God begins to move in your life and you're able to you're able to tithe, you're able to give, you're able to have some freedom, you're able to go on vacation, all of those things. And so there is a freedom of of just knowing that God is at work in our lives when we let him take over. So I want to give you just kind of go back uh, over just the the, uh, the last couple of weeks. Some of you, you weren't here, maybe you're working, you're doing some things, and I uh, just kind of want to go over some things, that just some principles that will help you in your, your finances. And here's uh, just a reminder. Jesus taught more about money and possessions than he did on faith and prayer. He knew that this would be the one thing that would be competing for our heart is money and possessions, and I need more. And see, there, there's call, there's a thing called retail therapy. Retail therapy is shop because it'll make you feel better. Hello. Anybody ever been there, done that? I'm feeling kind of bad. I need to go buy me something, you know, and uh, it's called <laughs> retail therapy. And then what happens? They end up man, this feels good. I need to buy something else. Well, that made me feel really good, too. And so all of a sudden, your credit cards get maxed out, and uh, and then you look at your debt, and you're having trouble spending them, so you feel really bad. So what do you do? Well, i got to buy something else because it makes me feel better. And you uh, you end up in, in real true bondage. So here's some, some of the things that, that we talked about the last couple of weeks. Number one, this is what Jesus said. You can't serve money and God. You can't serve God and money. It's, it was interesting because he didn't say you can't serve God in pleasure. You can't serve God in, you know, and just name anything. Now, he said God in money because that is, is a, a, it's, it's a lie. It's deceptive by the enemy to say if I get a certain amount of money, then I'll be happier. If I buy a certain object or house or car or whatever it may be, I'll be then happy. The truth of it is, if you're not happy now, you're not going to be happy then. Because happiness comes from inside. Happiness comes from your relationship with Jesus Christ. One of the things that, that was just a revelation to Lisa and I, in our marriage, we went to this, this uh, seminar, and they said, you're not responsible for your spouse's happiness. 
We looked at each other going, really? <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not responsible for you having it, so don't blame it on me if you're not happy. You know? we, but what, what was it? But the, the truth of it was happiness comes from within. And we look for things to try to make us happy, and really it's when we understand who we are in Christ and our personal relationship with him, it changes everything. So we, um, we just look at that. We, we, we can't serve God in money. Money serves us as we serve God. Money serves us. We're not going after it. We're not, you know, and there's, there's a lot of people who, man, they, I talked to a guy the other day. He said, all I do is work. He said, I'm just kind of, I'm just kind of hooked on work. You know, it, I'm making great money. I'm over in Louisiana. I'm working 14. Uh, I mean, he worked seven, 14, seven 12s and seven 14s. He said, man, I'm just killing it. I said, yeah, but when do you get to spend it? Well, I don't know, one day. You know, but right now, man, what, what, what's he doing? He's not taking a break from anything. You know, he's serving money instead of money serving him. Are you all with me? All right. We love God, not money. Money's neutral. Money's neutral. It's just money. It's good to have money. If you have money, there's nothing wrong with money. It's just making sure it's in the right, in the right place. God wants you to have all of it. If you look at the people in the Bible, Abraham was a very wealthy man. Job was a very wealthy man. It's not a problem with, with having wealth. It's a problem of where's your heart. That is the, the truth. So we see these, um, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. That's what the Word of God says. So we don't want to love money. We want to love Jesus. We need, to, this is Dave Ramsey, we need to live like nobody else for a season so we can give like nobody else for a lifetime. That is one of those things. Man, if we just hang on a minute. So last week, we talked about three things that we need to embrace, three values that we need to embrace. Well, one of the values is we need to plan, the value of planning. We will no longer be strapped financially, but we will plan to be free from debt. We, uh, the last couple of weeks, we talked about um, debt snowball. You can, there's ways that you can pay your debt off. You start with your smallest one and then pay that off. And then take that payment, put it on the next one. There's some very practical ways that you can do that. Wednesday night, we had Mike Cupper here. He's a financial planner. He does things, and it's complimentary. He'll come to your house. He'll sit down with you. He'll show you how you can get out of debt. That's one of his jobs. It's his ministry. And so about 40 people were lining up to, to get some help last week. So take advantage of that. The second one is we, we value the... Um, We'll embrace the value of sacrifice, right? We'll give up something we love for something we love more. That's what we talked about. What is sacrifice? Well, I love that $4 cup of coffee every morning. But maybe if I sacrifice that because I love the fact that I don't want a car payment anymore. Hello. All you Starbucks people, y'all just I just lost you right there. Man. I don't know what you're talking about, baby. I ain't giving up that thing. Well, you, you may love that more. All right, but there's simple things that, that we can do. Uh, and the next one is we will have self-control, which is the value that we embrace as well. It's one of the fruits of the Spirit, self-control. We will have self-control and say no for a little while so we can say yes for the rest of our lives. All right, so that brings us up to the first uh, couple of messages because it's just simple, practical stuff on how can I get out of debt. And we find ourselves, many of us, We've maxed out the credit cards, even though we've now cut them off and we've learned the hard way, whatever. Now we've got to do something. Well, there are some practical ways that you can do that. So we're doing today, today's message, and Unstrapped, is, uh, is putting God first. And this is where it really comes to the heart of the matter. And I want, I want to just give you some practical things. For those of you who've been Christians for a while, you understand this. This message really is to confirm what you already know and what you're already doing. But it's also to help those who have just began to walk with Jesus Christ. This is a new thing for you. And so we are trying to help you learn just the simple things of how I can become close to God. Matthew 6, Jesus said this. He said, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Seek what? First, the kingdom of God. Seek him first. A lot of times... We find ourselves not doing that. We're seeking all other types of things, and then maybe God will throw him in. I want to give you just three reasons why I'm, I'm doing this series. I kind of want, man, why is he talking about this? Let me just give you three reasons. Number one is God blesses obedience. And I really want your lives, your families to be blessed. 
I really want you to walk in blessing. Once you begin to understand the blessings of God and how you can depend on Him, He He comes in a way, in such a practical way, that He's not the man upstairs. He's He's the God who knows every need that we have, and He's our Jehovah Jireh. He's our provider. And once you understand that, I mean, you know, if you if you've had bills, but you say, God, I've been faithful in my tithes. Man, I've got this, this, and this, and I need your help. And then all of a sudden it comes through. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. All right? See, you know what I'm talking about because you're living it. So many of you may not even know the practical way that God can minister to you. So I want you to be blessed, all right? And the, the, the fact of the second thing is you need to get out of debt. You just need to get out of debt. You need to learn how to live and work with your finances. And number three, the reason why I'm doing it is because it works. It just works. And I want you to learn that. Man, it's, it's not just, oh, he's asking for our money, he's begging for me. No, I'm not begging for your money. That's not what this is about. I'm trying to get you to put God first and watch this beautiful relationship you can have with him. Because I'm telling you, he loves us, all right? So here's the spiritual part of it. All right, can I, can I say something? I just want to say this, and this isn't enough. But you know, for some, some pastors, they don't want to preach on this. And, and you know why? Because they, they're hesitant on you getting too blessed. All right? Let, let, let me explain. Let, let me explain. Because here's what happens. We've had, we've had couples, and, and, I, and I love every one of them. I bless every one of them, a lot of that. But they, they, they came in. I have done their premarital counseling with one couple. I can just give you an example. They got saved during our premarital counseling. I did their wedding, and uh, they became active in our church. They were just doing great. And they began to tithe. I taught them how to tithe. Finances, so man, just be faithful in that and watch God do something. They both got different jobs, better jobs, made more money. You know, they prayed for a kid. First they couldn't have a kid, then they had a, you know, miscarriage, and then we prayed through them. Then they had one kid, then they had two kids. Now, you know, they're making so much money, they think, man, we got to have a bigger house, you know. And what they do is they choose to not go here to Summerwood or Tassie. No, they're going all the way over to Sugarland and other places. And then they say, I love you, Pastor, but see you. Right? That happens. You know? So we just bless them. And some pastors go, I'm not preaching this because I don't want them to be blessed that much. You know what? I want you to be blessed that much. All right? I want you to be blessed. Just, just don't leave too quick. All right? Here we go. Spiritual Tithing. Here it is. For those who don't know this, this is new to you. All right. Just let me just let me uh, help you with some very practical things. Tithing means tenth or ten percent. Some of you, this is going to be brand new, and you're thinking, "What in the world is he talking about?" All right. So this is ten percent. It's putting God first. All right. This is different from giving. This is tithing. It's not ours to give. We bring it. So what is tithing? Are you taking notes? Hopefully, you're taking some notes. Right. And I want to give you just some practical stuff. What is tithing? Two definitions. Tithing is returning the first 10% of our income to God's church. All right? Leviticus 27, 30. This is what it says. It says the tithe of everything from the land, whether it grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to who? It belongs to the Lord. Let me give you just some practical things. When you get your paycheck, right? Not net, but gross. All right? Somebody, they, they asked even the other night, do we give a, a, a net on the net or the gross? Well, my comment to that is, do you want a gross blessing or a net blessing? All right? I think you want a gross blessing. Okay? That's the whole thing. It belongs to the Lord. What do we do? We bring, don't give, we're bringing it back to the Lord. It belongs to Him. 10%, that first 10% of what we have, the reason is God is wanting you to trust Him. Now, here's the interesting thing. Many of you are sitting here in this room and you think, I trust God with my salvation. I believe that he's not going to let me go to hell. He's going to prepare for me a place in heaven, right? You're trusting with your eternity, but you're not trusting with the 10%, right? And so God is saying is, wait a minute, I'm trying to help you. You can trust me. If you can trust me for eternity, you can trust me with the practical. So the 10, first 10% that we have, it's not ours. It belongs to the who? The Lord. It is holy to the Lord. That belongs to Him. So we see that it's holy, it's set apart, designated for another purpose. The tithe is holy, it's set apart, and it belongs to God. So it's not really giving, we're just bringing it to the Lord, right? Because it belongs to Him. So, 
can't give what's not yours. All right? Well, I give my tithes. No, you bring your tithes. That belongs to him. So we bring the tithes. So we turn it to this house. It's like saying, well, I don't want what belongs to God in my house. I want what belongs to God in his house. Do you get that? I want you to grab a hold of that truth because it is so true. Second thing is, tithing is bringing to God the first and the best so he can bless the rest. Right? When we give God the first, then he blesses the rest. The first thing that leaves our hand is the tithe. Now, let's say, for an example, that you do work at someone's house. They pay, and you say, I'm going to do this work, but I'm going to charge you $1,000. All right? So that $1,000, they came out the last day. They see your work. It's excellent. And then they come along, and they give you 10 $100 bills. That's $1,000. How much is the tithe? $100. All right? I'm trying to make it real simple. $1,000. $100 All right. So, how much of that $1,000 belongs to God? All of it does. That's great. But how much is the tithe? $100. So, what do we get before you pay any bills or anything else? What is the first thing that should leave your hand? The $100 that belongs to God. Is that, that's just as simple as you can get it. And a lot of people go, man, I don't know. i got to pay all my bills and then... Maybe what's left, I can give some to God. What he's saying is, you can trust me. This is what I want you to understand. This is a personal relationship with God that you can trust him. Trust him. This is where your heart, this is where your maturity is going to grow. Proverbs uh, 3, 9 and 10 says, Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of, uh, of all your crops, then... Here's a promise. God never asks you to do something that he doesn't come back and give you a promise. Right? He's going to bless you. He blesses obedience. If you'll honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops, then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. What are they saying? Trust me and then watch me bless you. All right? Are you getting it? All right. Why? Because God blesses obedience. So... Two types, two reasons why why that we tithe because God blesses obedience. It's the first; it belongs to the Lord. Okay, so now why should we tithe? I'm gonna give you three reasons on why we should tithe. So maybe here you go. I don't know. Why. You give me ten reasons, I ain't gonna do it. All right, that's nobody in here because your heart's open. So let me give tithing here provides for God's work through the church. All right, so Jesus loves the church. God for the church, right? We love the church. And I'm telling you, in a day when literally, I read an article yesterday, and it said before the year's up, 1,200 churches in America will shut their doors. 1,200 door, 1200 churches in America will shut their doors. They're filing bankruptcy, and they're closing their doors. We are still a lighthouse in this community. We are still open. Amen? To God be the glory. All right? And here's the thing. We're making a difference in the community. We really are. I mean, look at the different nations' ministries. You know, everything, if you're new here, we're Fellowship of the Nations. Well, we have Baby Nation, we got Kid Nation. Right now, the children are being taught they have their own church service. Right? So that's Kid Nation. We have Spanish Nation. For those who are uh, uh, Spanish speaking, there, there's a service that's going on right there at the same time. So we're ministering to them as well. So then we've had, we have not only these ministries, we got Freedom Nation Ministry. They're in the and the uh, juvenile detention centers, they're ministering over there. So Freedom Nation, we got Fighter Nation. Hello, Fighter Nation right here. Okay, what are they doing? They're ministering to kids. I mean, you, you see all of these things. How is it happening? You. Your faithfulness makes it, we're not a denomination. Some of you, you know, many of you came out of the Catholic Church and think, well, the Catholic Church is a denomination, you know, it makes it happen. No, there is none other. Our source is God, but our source who gives to you, and then he's waiting for you to be obedient to get back to keep the doors open, right? So we're, we're, you know, look around. This is who we're depending on. All of us together, walking in obedience, God set it up that way. He said, bring the tithe into the storehouse, right? Why? So it can be a blessing so people can come in, they can get saved, they can get baptized, they can be discipled, they can learn what their gifts are. They can minister. They can find the joy of their life in ministry. All of those things happen because of this right here. Does that make sense? 
All right? I'm just I'm teaching you something. Hopefully it's going gonna, it's gonna to happen. So this is it. We depend on the Lord, but as God gives you help, God gives you a job, God blesses you, and then he wants you just to walk in obedience. Malachi, um, the second thing is I believe that the, the local church, it's the hope of the world. I really do. I believe it's the, the local church is the hope of the world. Malachi 3.10 says, Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Now, the whole tithe. Now, here's, here's the, uh, the interesting thing. If it's not 10% of your income, it's not a tithe. It's a tip. All right? Uh, I don't know what the term might be. It's in the Right there. All right. Term, term, I got mad at me one day because he was, he was having all these financial struggles. And I said, uh, and he, he's giving me permission to say this. I'm not here to embarrass him. You know, but, but it's, it's just true. You know, well, I can't believe it. I'm having this, this, and this. And I said, okay, I said, won't you quit tipping God and start tithing? He got mad at me. All right. You guys got mad at me. I said, all right, I'm just telling you the truth. If you want God to bless you, quit tipping him and start tithing. And uh, you know what? He started tithing. All right. God has blessed me. It's been about nine years ago. God's probably more than quadrupled his salary from then. Why? Because he's just been obedient. I'm, listen to me. This is, I'm not one of those health, wealth, prosperity preachers. That's not it. I'm just talking about God's word. Okay? I don't have airplanes. You know, I'm just telling you. I'm, this isn't that kind of message. Right? You know, hey, give to my ministry. So, you know, it's not any of that. I'm, I'm telling you. It works. It just works. And you can talk to Termite afterwards. He can give you the details on it. All right? It just works. It's like this. You know, well, I think I may tie No, it's, it's like you're either pregnant or you're not, right? You don't get halfway pregnant. Well, I think I'm, I think, no, you're pregnant. All right? That's the difference. With time. You're either swimming or drowning, right? You know? I mean, if, if, if you, quote, tithe like you were swimming, if you were out in the ocean, and if you... We're tithing like you're, no, you would be drowning, right? So we want you swimming. We want you tithing. That's why life is going to come to you. The storehouse is the Old Testament picture of the New Testament church, right? And so this is one of the things we see, this storehouse here. This is the storehouse. And what I'm telling you, Lisa and I do, right? We do the same thing. The first thing that leaves our hands, and she, she would, Go, she puts a check in the, in the bank. She will stop in the, in the way that we have the tithing set up. She just texts it in. It's there. Right? And because God has helped us already get out of debt, right? We've already paid off our home. We paid off our, our truck, our car, all of those things. We're giving over and above. Why? Because we trust Him. You can't outgive God. You, you just can't do it. So that's, that's the storehouse, all right? Here's what's interesting is that God is using this church because of your faithfulness. We do the same thing. Now, some of you know this. I'm just trying to explain it to you. Whatever comes in, 10% of that, you can ask Carol right there. She's our financial secretary. She takes 10% of the income, and she puts it in missions. Do you know that right now in Cambodia, 97% of their population are Buddhist? But we have now two churches that are there. And one of them is in a remote village. It's, it's trying to be completed. The church body is there. The building is not complete because it's been a rainy season, right? But we're there as a light. 1% of, of Cambodia are Christians. And so we're going to put as many as God will allow, one little village at a time, being the light of Jesus. And that's how we're going to change Cambodia. Amen? It's going to happen. It's going to happen. Listen. I believe that God is going to give us, and this is what I said, God is going to give us at least five a year that we can plant. Over the next ten years, I believe God will give us at least 50 churches that are going to be in India and in Cambodia and wherever else God leads us. Right? Why does that happen? Because of your faithfulness. You're sitting there thinking, well, why am I giving? No, God takes what you give, and 10% of that is ministering over to other parts of the world. Okay? I'm just, I'm just telling you, I just want to be honest with you. So, what does it do? Tithing also, it teaches us to put God first. In Deuteronomy 14.25, says the purpose of the tithe is to teach you always to put God first in your lives with holy reverence. Put 
God first. God over and over in Scripture says that. So, why? Because there's few tangible measurements that show your heart. And this is one of them. How much do I love God? Well, I love Him to obey Him. He said, okay, well then fine. Bring that. That belongs to me. Give it back to Him. See, it's, it's just practical stuff. You, you can look at your bank statement and you can see if you actually put God first. So, I'm just saying. He is our Jehovah Jireh. He is our provider. And He will provide, I promise you. Give God our first so the rest is blessed. Here's something practical. Every day, you need to start your day. I was going to help you in this, just your walk with the Lord. You think, man, I'm going to have to change my whole lifestyle. Well, it puts God first, yes, right? In the morning, you need to give God the first, all right? If your devotion time is 10 minutes, 15 minutes, whatever it is, give God the first and the rest is blessed. You see, what you did here this morning, you gave God the first day of the week. You're here. So you can go ahead and give yourself a hand. You're all right. You're all right. You did good. Now, in the morning, give him your first 15 minutes. You say, man, I don't have time in the morning. Then set your clock 15 minutes earlier. All right? Go to bed 15 minutes earlier. All right? Are we being practical? Yeah, but why? Because give God the first and the rest is blessed. I send out to a lot of people these encounters, right? And I got to tell you, it took me a little while to discipline because I want to just read and then get going. But it makes you sit still for 15 minutes, all right? And it's a meditation. And uh, some people don't like them. Some people like, you know, quit sending them to me. <clears throat> Just forgive me if you get one and you don't like it, okay? Maybe God is saying, try it, all right? But, but what do you do? You want to give God your first. Start the day off with Him, all right? And when you do that, you do the first day of the week. Uh, that's Sunday. Do the first hour of the, of the day. Sometime in there, five minutes, ten minutes. Wake up and, and recognize God. And then what we do is we give the first three weeks of the year. The first three weeks that, that we see in, in January, we give three weeks for fasting and prayer. That's the Daniel fast. So we want to do that. So we give the first three weeks of the year. Then we take the first of our, our 10% of our income and we bring it as tithes as an act of worship. So I promise you, he will stretch your 90% a whole lot further than you can. All right? He can. So let's move on. So if we if we give him our leftovers last, that does not take faith, because without faith it's impossible to please God. Now some of you are sitting there going, I hate God. I don't know why he's talking about money. All right? This will change your life. I promise you, this will change your life. It all belongs to him. Here's, here's the thing. Can I shoot straight with you? If you're not tithing, and I'll say this one love, but I'm just going to quote a scripture to you. God says you're stealing from me. He says you're stealing from me. And it's just true. We're stealing from God. So I'm just trying to give you the truth. Every time you don't tithe, you steal from God. I'm, I'm just, you're not believing. You think I'm just, you know, I, I mean, the truth is, some of you may come to church in a, in a stolen car. You bought it with God's money. I'm just saying, in love, Malachi 3, this is what, what the Word of God says, Malachi 3, 8 and 9, will a man rob God? And here's, he's talking to a nation that's gotten away from him. They just, they, they, they love pleasure, they love all these things, and they got away from God. Will a man rob God? Yet you rob me, but you ask, how do we rob you? This is what God says. In times and often, he said, you're under a curse, the whole nation of you, because you are robbing me. Is that what he said? God said it. Alright? So, you know, are y'all going to believe it? You're going to walk out going, I don't care what the Bible says. You know, I ain't robbing God. No, he said you're robbing me. And you're tied. If the 10% which belongs to him isn't given, then you're robbing God. Hello. And here's, here's the thing. This, this is what I'm going to get. Do you, do you know that there's a way that says your money's cursed? Some of you right now, you have lost money in certain different areas of your life. How did that happen? My car broke down, or I did this, or I lost money on that, or whatever you wanted. Why am I losing so much money? Your money's cursed. Boy, you got real quiet there. Look, we don't want to be that person ever again. Okay? He said, I've never tied, but I'm going to start today. Good. 
All right, ask God to forgive you for robbing him, and then say, I'll never do it again, and then we'll move on. Amen. And the people said, Amen. All right, we're moving on. No guilt. That was the thing from when we started this. No guilt. Here we go. Some people say the law. Well, that tithing is under the law. Well, let me just give you a few things, right? Because the truth of it is, tithing predated the law. Abraham tithed. The law didn't come until Moses several hundred years later, right? So he was already tithing before that. So what, what does God want? God wants the person the rest is blessed. It started in the garden. God told Adam and Eve, he said, well, you can have all of this stuff except that tree right there. That's mine. Don't touch it. It started in the garden. Then when they went through the, the going into the promised land, he said, there's 31 kings that you're going to have to take out. I will help you do that. I'll fight your battles for you. He said, but this very first one in Jericho, all of those spoils and everything else, all of that belongs to me. Don't take the dime. Don't take any of it. It belongs to me. So what did they do? One of the guys, he took some money, right? He hid it in his tent. Then the next uh, group that they were going to go conquer was a smaller group. They, they didn't send out the whole army. They just sent about three or 4,000 guys. Just go over there and take care of those guys. What did they do? They got beat. And then what happens? You see, Joshua comes back and he's falling on his face. Well, God, oh God, oh God, what happened? What happened? He said, Get up. Let me talk to you like a man. You got a sin in the camp. Somebody took what was mine. And so they went right down the line. All the 12 tribes, and they said, It's that tribe. And they took the tribes and came to that tribe. They went down the list and said, It's that guy right there. They said, What did you do? What have you done? Uh, I took God's money. So it's cursed. It's serious. It's serious. Some of you are wondering, why can't I walk in victory? Why am I not happy? Why am I not making it with my family? Why am I not you're robbing God and your money's cursed? God is saying, I want the first and I'll bless the rest. Okay? I got three minutes more. Matthew 23, 23. It says, What sorrow awaits you, leaders of religious law and you Pharisees? This is Jesus talking about in the New Testament, right? And this is what he says. What sorrow awaits you, leaders of religious law and Pharisees? You hypocrites, for you're careful to tithe the tiniest income from your herb gardens, but you ignore the more important aspects of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. You should tithe, yes, but do not neglect the more important things. You know what Jesus is saying? He said tithing should be a no-brainer. Tithing should be that when you get saved, you just say, you're going to obey me, and you're just going to do it. All right? Tithing should not be a big thing in our life. He said, just make it part of your lifestyle. Bring what belongs to me, and then let's get on. With what? With justice, mercy, and faith. I've got a ministry for you to do. Right? Let's start with this relationship of trusting me. Then let's continue on to mature. Some people are getting so hung up with, oh, I don't know if I can do that. And God's like, really? You're not going to trust me with this, and I've got all of this ministry waiting for you? I've got an abundant life waiting in you, but you can't get over this. That's what he was telling the religious leaders of the day. He said, you bunch of hypocrites. You know, oh, you want to tithe of every little, even your tiniest herbs, you're going to tithe. Excuse me, I got some of this, you know. Rosemary. But yet you're the sublime and divine. You don't have faith. You don't have mercy on people. You don't have justice. None of that. He's trying to get us to grow up. That should be one of the first things we do. I get saved, I get baptized, I start tithing. That is Christianity 101. Amen? Then we move on. Then you say, oh, but then, you know, the Old Testament, man, that's the law. I don't want to be under the law. Okay, you want to be under grace? Well, let's look at grace. All right? You don't, don't play the Old Testament, New Testament law grace game. All right? It, 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 it doesn't work. Because in the Old Testament, it says don't murder. New Testament, grace says don't even hate anybody. Hello? Old Testament law says don't commit adultery. Grace says don't even look at a woman with lust in your heart. Hello? Old Testament, grace says, uh, Old Testament says tithe. Grace says it belongs, all belongs to God. That's grace. He said, present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is a reasonable act of worship. All of your time and your talent and your treasure all belongs to God. But he's saying, but let's start with that. Right? Because I want to use you. I created you with purpose. I created you for ministry. Every member here is a what? 
minister. Every minister has what? A minister. Let's get on. Let's grow up. Let's mature. All right? So we see that this is what God wants to do. He wants to use us. Tithing builds our faith in God. This is what Malachi 3.10 says. He says, test me in this. The only, only time in the Bible he says you can test God. What, what did Jesus say to, to, uh, to the devil when he was in the wilderness? You will not, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Don't test me. That's what he was saying. But here he's saying, this one place you can test me. He says, test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. Come on. Somebody believe in that? Wait a minute. You're not going to have room enough for it. Some of you have sheds in your backyard because you ran out of room in your house. Some of you got storage units that are full. Maybe you got two units. Why? Because you got more than enough. God has already blessed you. All right, are you with me? Okay, okay, can I just get, I'm, I'll give you just a, a practical thing. All right? Anytime, you know, we as pastors, whatever, we're transparent, you know, sometimes you're, Maybe you're a target of criticism. I don't care. I love you enough. I'm just going to be honest with you, okay? Let me show you what, what, what got me. When I, when I was younger, I thought it was, it was cool. You know, I wanted, man, those, those people would have Corvettes. That would be really awesome, Corvette. When you're six foot six, that's not practical. But, it's, it's, you know, it's just, it's just one of those things. But the Lord showed me something that recently. And, and, and what it is is Lisa's dad passed away a little over two years ago, Right? She inherited a Corvette. You with me? What did it cost us? Nothing. It was just an inheritance. So what do we have sitting in our garage? We don't drive it, but it is a 1996 collector's edition Corvette sitting in our garage. Right? Don't be a hater. All right? All right, come on. I'm just, I'm just telling you. We're not even driving. You know? Probably pray. Somebody can criticize. Oh, my God. I gave him, he preached on money, and now he bought a car. Our bed. No, we got to sit in there. Well, okay, several years ago, Lisa was, you know, she said, man, I, I want a golf cart. I said, man, we're not going to spend money on a golf cart. You know, I said, we're going to do that. No, no, but our grandbabies want to drive a golf cart. No, we're not going to do it. Well, her dad passed away. He had a golf cart. So I guess what, what's in our garage? A golf cart, right? So in my garage, I have, I have a 1996 Corvette, and I have a golf cart. You know what we don't have? We don't have room enough. Because she can't put her car in the garage. <laughs> this is what the Lord said. He said, I bless you so much that you didn't have room enough for your stuff. You see? I didn't even ask for it. But God blesses. Right? If you see me driving it one day, don't be hating. Just, just know I am packed in that sucker like a sardine, and I'm not comfortable at all. I'm just kidding. No, I will give you a smoking deal if somebody wants it. No, I'm kidding. Anyway, does that make sense? Haven't you found that you are blessed abundantly? You got more. You know, some of us, we just got back to Panama, you know, and you're living there with those cunas, and you're sleeping in hammocks, and you see them living in grass huts and dirt floors, and the bathroom is out over the water, right? And you got to get up in the middle of the night and, you know, stumble out. To, and you're thinking, I'm blessed. This morning, it was just a reminder, I was sitting there shaving, and I had running water, I had electricity, you know, and I had air conditioning, and it just reminded me, look how blessed you are. I said, yes, your father, I am. And it took me back to those people sitting in those huts. And I, that was my 32nd trip. When I went so many years ago, they were in huts. We go back, 2019, they're still living in huts. You know, we are blessed, folks. All right, does that make sense? All right. Here it says, God says, I dare you. I dare you. Test God in this and see if God will bless you. It works. Listen, this isn't about money. Maybe God will still bless your marriage. Maybe your marriage isn't as good as you, you want it to be. Maybe your children need to get saved. Maybe there's some other blessing. Maybe you're having some health problems. Maybe God just said, I want to bless you. So get, get in line with me and just watch blessings begin to flow. Don't always put a dollar figure on something. It's not just about money, okay? Minister, better friendship, having churches that, uh, that push you to grow to maturity. That's why I'm doing it. 
You, you know, one of the things, I played basketball, and I remember the eighth grade, I had this coach. And this coach, I'm going to tell this story before, but I'm just telling it again. What he did was, he would scream at me every day. I mean, uh, eighth grade, six feet tall, about that big around, you know, and he screamed and hollered at me, you know. And when he talked, he always would spit. And, you know, he just showers. You know, he would do that. I mean, he even shoved me one time. I mean, I went flying across the floor, you know. And it was just, you know, he was just intense. And one day, I just went up to him and said, hey, coach, you don't like me? I mean, I'd do something to you. I mean, I just kind of was up to here, you know. What's up? And uh, he looked at me and said, Brady, I believe in you. I believe you have a lot of potential to be a great basketball player. He said, and I'm going to push you so you'll get there. Change my perspective. He doesn't hate me. He believes in me. Change me. All of a sudden, it's like, I get it. I'm going to work harder. Somebody believes that I can actually play basketball. You know what? I believe in you. I'm telling you, sitting here in this room, I believe in you. That God not only created you and loves you and for most of you has saved you. And I'm going to push you to quit walking in the ways of the world. Get right with God and start living for Him. Just be obedient to what He's calling you to do. So then what? So He'll bless your heart. But He doesn't bless you so you can sit on blessings. He blesses you so you can be a blessing to other people. That you can minister and you can love and you can nurture, you can help people, teach people. That's why. I believe that I'm, I'm telling you, and I will tell you again and again, I believe some of the best ministries, even though we have some good ones, I think Fighter Nation is amazing, Freedom Nation is amazing, Hope Nation is amazing, all these different ministries that God's given us, but I believe even the best have yet to be planted yet. They're in seed form in some of your hearts because the experiences you have, different things that God is calling you, it's in seed form. God wants to raise up a ministry through you, a nation through you, whatever it may be. And he's with you. I'm up here pushing. You get mad at me if you want to, but I'm telling you, this is one of the areas, this is one of the first things. Get saved, get baptized, start tithing, and then get on with your ministry. Amen? Because I believe some of the best ministries have yet to been birthed, and they're getting ready to be through you. Amen? Let's go to the Lord. Thank you so much for being a part of our online streaming. I hope you really enjoyed the message today. And I want you to just take it to heart. Whatever the Lord has spoken to you, just take it to heart. And, and I pray that if you have never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that today would be that day. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. So that's what we're praying for you. And if you're wondering, how do I get to know Jesus as my Lord and Savior? Well, let me tell you, it's pretty simple. First of all, Jesus loves you more than anybody on this planet. So let me tell you, he's wanting you to know him. So as you come to him, we recognize, one, that we've sinned against God. Everybody has. The Bible says that all have sinned. We've fallen short of the glory of God. Well, we recognize that one. We don't have to be told that. We know that. The second thing is, it says that God demonstrated his love for us, and that's you. God loves you even though that we were sinners. That's how much he cares for you. So you got to get it out of the way. He's not judging you. He already sent his son to die in our place so that we could have all of our sin placed upon him. And then we believe we had faith in him that that's what he did. And he did it because he loved us. The Bible says the wages of our sin is death. Well, Jesus took our death sentence for us. But then it doesn't leave it as a negative. It says, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus. It's not works. It's not a a church membership somewhere. It's not giving money to somebody. All of those are good things, but this not, does not bring salvation. So now, how do you get there? It's only in Jesus. So simply just open your heart and say, Jesus, I'm a sinner. Please forgive me of my sin. Come into my heart. Save me. Forgive me. I want to turn away from all the stupid stuff that I'm doing. And I want to turn to you. I want you to be my Lord, my Savior, the boss of my life. And Jesus, come in and save me. I want to love you. I want to live for you. I want to obey your word all the days of my life. And that's what you can do. Pray that prayer right now. And I'll tell you, Jesus is waiting. And the moment, the instant you do that, you will be saved. And my encouragement to you, 
Find a great Bible-believing, Bible-preaching church. Get connected. Now, if you're in the Houston area, man, we would love to have you at Fellowship of the Nations. But you're in different parts of the country or even around the world. Find somewhere that they're preaching Jesus. And I promise you, it will change your life. Hope you can join us again next week. And uh, up until then, we'll be praying for you. Pray for us. We'd love to hear from you. Just go on our website, FOTN.org, Fellowship of the Nations, and let us hear from you. God bless you.